Good morning. Why don't we have a word of prayer together? Father, we are grateful to you for all that you do. We thank you this morning for all of the reminders that we had in the songs that we have sung. Lord, we live our lives and the challenges of each day are sufficient enough. They pull us in a thousand and one directions, trying to make sense, Lord, of the adversity as well as the successes. Trying to keep all things in a, in a manner, Lord, that brings about an uh, abundant life, but also recognizes your divine sovereignty over all things. We, as we have discovered in our study of the book of Acts, we live and move and have our very being in you. You are the one that circumscribes our boundaries, our length of days. It is one day, Lord, that we will stand before you and give an account for this life that we are living. A desire is on that day, Lord, to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. To recognize that every day we are making choices to move closer to you, or to find that there are obstacles and encumbrances in the way. Help us to remove them. Help us to have such a big picture of Jesus that we run this race of faith with great endurance. Finding in the process, Lord, that you are conforming us more and more into the image of your Son. May we be a blessing, Lord, in the world in which you have planted us. May our light shine. May we be that salt of the earth. May we demonstrate a love that can only be accounted for because the Holy Spirit has taken residence in us. That alone, Lord, will change the world as we do it in Jesus' name. For you are the great Redeemer. And all praise belongs to you. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been uh, studying the book of Acts. And uh, the book of Acts, um, just to give us a, a framework, right? You had the life of Jesus. Jesus now is crucified, dead, and buried. And then he is resurrected. When he resurrects from the dead, he comes to his disciples and says, I want to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. He does so by, by meeting them uh, on this day of Pentecost, which opens up the book of Acts and reminds us again how God is the one who is able to just do exceeding abundant beyond all that we can think or imagine. And so as a result of that, um, the Spirit of God beginning to fill us, Jesus makes a promise to his disciples. He says, look, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And so the book of Acts, while one of its principal characters is the apostle Paul and how he goes around to various countries speaking to them of the grace of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, the real, the real um, text of scripture is how God is beginning to move this word of grace from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And uh, you've heard me say this before, but I think they did a pretty good job because here we are in 2016 and we're still talking about it. So I want to just jump into a text this morning and um, it really is from Acts chapter 21 through 22. So it's a very long passage, but I try to break it down so that we could all come together. And then I'm going to bring everything together with a conclusion from a, another New Testament story. So in your, in your sermon notes, if you pull them out, they're in your bulletin. I'm just uh, going to highlight a number of these texts and you can go, you know, I just invite you to go back and read this chapter again on your own. But Paul is traveling again. He has done a number of missionary journeys and now he's on his way to Jerusalem. In the text that we will find, you'll find that he is all the way 
uh, oh, um, over on Macedonia, and he begins to make his way all the way around from Ephesus, where he had been staying, and he begins to come all the way around there. Now, there have been a number of things that I want you to take um, uh, note of in this text, and so I put in these highlighted texts. In Acts chapter 20, verse 22 to 23, he says, and now compelled by the Spirit, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem, and not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships face me. So while Paul is, is um, fixed his attention now on coming back to Jerusalem, everywhere he goes, he's being reminded that there is going to be some real difficulty when he gets there. Acts chapter 21 only serves to confirm this when it says in verse 10 that after we had been there a number of days, speaking of um, uh, Jesus, um, Paul's travels, he says, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt and he tied his own hands and feet. And he said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was constantly receiving this message that trouble was coming, wouldn't it give you a little pause in your spirit? Wouldn't you say, well, maybe now's not the time. Like some of us buy into a, a theology that if we're in Jesus, everything ought to be happy. If we're walking in the will of God, then things ought to just like settle out. There ought to be this, this peace that just permeates everything I do, so it's like the lubrication of life. Wrong answer. Because very often, by us being this light and salt, it puts us in opposition with the world itself. Paul is out here preaching a redemption that is to be found in Jesus. And now wherever he goes, yes, there is re renewal, revival that breaks out, but there's also a lot of opposition and persecution. And so he's being told right now that when he goes back to Jerusalem, there's going to be some hardship. When he arrives in Jerusalem, Paul is welcomed, he's warned, and he's assaulted. He comes to Caesarea, a little town up on the seacoast, and then he makes his way down to Jerusalem. Now, he had not been there for a long time. The last time Paul was in the city of Jerusalem, they had this council, and it was a, it was a very intense one where they were deciding what real um, requirements were they going to place on the shoulders of Gentile believers who were now coming to know Jesus. So there was some heavy theological discussion, because remember, the Jews, all their lives, they were brought up with this law. And now it says Jesus didn't abolish the law, but he came to fulfill it. And so as a result now, it says our standing with God is not based on performance. Our standing with Jesus is based on grace. Jesus' righteousness is now imputed unto us. So when God looks at you, does he see a submission to his son? That's the biggest question. And so now, Paul comes to Jerusalem and he's warmed well, well, uh, warmly by the, by the elders that were there and James in particular. And, um, and so they gather together and then they say this, and this is in your notes. Look at Acts 21, verse 20 to 21. They said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law. Now, you ought to take a moment there and just pause, especially after all the things that we have been talking about. Because everything that Paul has been saying is that the requirements of the law, having been fulfilled in Jesus, and which, by the way, could never be fulfilled by us. I, I'm, I, um, I find sometimes people, when you talk to them, they say, well, look, if anybody just lives by the Ten Commandments, that's good. And I said, it wouldn't be good. It would be impossible. Because the standard of the Ten Commandments, the only one that could meet that is Jesus. And if perfection is what God the Father requires, then we're in a whole lot of trouble. But Jesus is the one that fulfills this law and as a result says, now I am going to be your substitute. 
So your sins now are placed on me. How many of you heard when uh, it says, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world? Because Jesus now becomes that substitute. His righteousness is now, as I said, clothed on us. And so when you read a text like this and it says many of the Jews believed, but they were also zealous for the Lord, it's like if I'm going to hold Jesus and in him I find total grace, total like acceptance, then why am I still over here trying to earn my way into heaven? Don't you see how that's in opposition one to another? It ought not to be. But the James who's speaking in this text is warning Paul saying, look, there's a lot of believers here, but there are many of them who are still zealous for the law. And then he says in verse 21, they have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. Paul wasn't denigrating the rituals that God had established. What he was saying is you can't look to them to bring justification into your life. Like it is not going to be the thing that is going to bring you into a right relationship with God. Because circumcision of the flesh was a sign. But God wants you now to repent deeply from the heart. He wants you to look not to your own, you know, uh, deeds, but he wants you to look to Jesus. And so now James knew what Paul was out there preaching. They had sent him out to go out and declare this gospel. But notice what goes on here in Acts 21 verse 27. Paul now had gone, there's a, a text there where they tried to make some kind of accommodation. So, you know, it's like you ever go to a, a house party and uh, you might have some strong views about things and then your family members come around and say, can you just cool it during this, this time when everybody's together? I know you're tempted, man, but just, just don't go there. Well, basically that's what they're saying to the apostle Paul, who has, by the way, been laying his life on the line for this gospel. And they're saying, look, I know there's a lot of Jews here. Can you just like try to get along with them? Impossible because the gospel that Paul was preaching was going to put him in opposition with all those Jews that were trying to balance this faith in Jesus and this keeping of the law. And so notice what happens here in verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, some of the Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and they seized him shouting, men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law and this place. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, News reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. And he once, and at once, he took officers and soldiers, ran down to the crowd, and when the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The only thing that saved Paul was the Romans. Can I also bring to your attention that this was one of the high feast days for the Jews, so this was the Feast of Pentecost. Yes, the mates from the Jewish historians tell us that there are a few million people that are in this city. They've all congregated from all around the known world and they're there to celebrate on this day of, uh, of Pentecost. And now what happens? They have now found in Paul someone to vent their anger and their frustration at this gospel that he's been preaching about Jesus. And so you get to the, you get to the point here that Paul now is in grave danger and the fulfillment of this prophecy seems to be holding true. But as I also put in your notes, Paul then uses that as an opportunity to give a personal testimony. I didn't write it all down here, but I, I did say, um, I just brought a conclusion here because see, the testimony that Paul gives in this chapter is less theological and it is more personal. It's about how God worked in his life. It tells the story about how he was zealous for the things of God, how he was a Pharisee by training. 
He was schooled in Gamaliel's, you know, uh, rabbinic school. He, he went out and, and persecuted those who had begun to, to follow after Jesus. He was zealous for the things of, of God and for the law in much the same way the Jews in the city were. But then he said, on my way to Damascus, God appeared to me and he opened my eyes and he began to teach me that he really was the redeemer sent. And so now what you read here is the conclusion of his remarks when Paul is telling them all of these things saying, look, I'm a Jew like you, but I've seen now that the fulfillment of all these prophecies have been fulfilled in Jesus. And so that's what I have been sharing. And then he tells them that at one point, the Lord said to him, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. In other words, this gospel wasn't only for the Jew, it was to be for the whole world. And if I could just put a little pause there for a moment, I want you to think about this. There was a promise that God made to Abraham, the father of our faith, who said, I will bless you. I will make, I will give you a great name. I will, he says, make you into a great nation. And through you, I will bless all the nations of the world. The reason why I bring this up now is because, see, this wasn't an afterthought with God. It wasn't like, okay, this is the Jewish Messiah and then everybody else, you know, you got to find your own way. No, God is the God of heaven and earth. All things fall under his sovereignty. But what God did was he chose to take one individual, Abraham, and through him bless all the nations of the world. Israel was supposed to be this vehicle by which people would look and see something of God's blessing on them and it would be used as a draw in much the same way that the church in the day in which we're living now ought to be the church. When it ceases to be the church, it ceases to be a blessing to the world and it ceases to have a reason to exist. But if we're faithful to this calling, then when we let our light shine, men see those gifts of justice and mercy and compassion and it changes things. And so that's what happens here. But notice the crowd wanted none of it. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this, and then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. Why? Because he was taking this gospel of grace to the Gentiles? See, they saw that as an offense to the nation of Israel that had received the promises of God, but they failed to recognize that the promises they received were so that they would be a blessing to everyone. So it's kind of like when the church, in their worst moments, if they huddle up, and then it's like the world and us, and we're like this holy huddle, what good is that? God says that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Our greatest strength is when we go out in Jesus' name and let the love of God that is changing us love on, the, uh, on, love on our neighbors. When that happens, people take notice. Why? Because now there is a love that forgives 70 times 7. There is a love that is not selfless or self-seeking. It's not rude. It's not proud. It's not envious. And people find that love kind of hard to resist. But if it's only about our church and about our rules and about the way in which we do our things, and if you don't agree with us, then we hate you. What good is that? That says nothing about the grace of Jesus. And that's basically what Israel is doing here. They're saying the world can go to hell, but we have our promises. Failing to recognize is that all those promises that God said to Israel to bless them were so that they in turn would bless the world. And so consequently, after Paul gives his testimony, they want to kill him. And, in, and, uh, and again, look in your text here, it says the Lord then offers some encouragement to Paul because at this point you think, okay, it's over. They're going to take this kid, they're going to take Paul and they're going to kill him. But notice in verse, in, in Acts 23, this is just a little hint of what's coming. He says, the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage. 
as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So I want you to read that text and I want you to, I want you to understand two things here. First, that it's not going to end here in Jerusalem. He is going to bring him to Rome. Rome, the crossroads where all the world comes together. Do you remember when Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you're gonna be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world? Well, this is the way that gospel is gonna to go to the uttermost parts of the world. He's gonna bring them to Rome. The second thing I want you to notice here is that what has Paul been doing that has gotten the attention of God? He has been testifying about God's grace. Sometimes we think that that's an option. That's not an option. If you have been saved by the blood of Jesus, then part of the mandate that we have in our life is to make sure that we share the hope that is within us. That as God opens up those opportunities, we get to share with people this redemptive story of a God who says, I don't hold your sins against you, but I want to be in relationship with you. I want to give you a peace that passes all understanding. I want to give you a filter by which you could look out at the world and begin to make wise, sober judgments. And if you want that for yourself, you want it for your kids, you want it for your friends, you want it for your family. You want it for the world because Jesus is the hope of the world. He's the one that can take those who are in opposite places and bring them together. The world is filled with examples like that. All because of Jesus. So now as a result of this, we recognize that Paul is not going to die in Jerusalem. And in fact, we begin to recognize that this book of Acts really isn't about Paul. It's about the gospel. It's about this good news that is being shared. Paul is merely the messenger. Paul is going to go up to Jerusalem, but the gospel he is carrying is going to wind up going to the ends of the earth. Because this is such a big point, I put this in your bulletin too, that the central point of the story is not the persecution of Paul, but the progress of the gospel. This gospel is going, nothing is going to stop it. It is going to find opposition in the world, but this gospel of God's grace is something that gives people hope. It gives them a sure foundation on which to build their life. And in the back of your head, can't you hear all those stories that Jesus shared about don't build your house on sand. If you build your house on sand, it's like the person who says, who hears the words of God, but doesn't listen to him. And then he goes about building his life. And when the storms of life come, it brings havoc into that life. But the person who hears the words of God and puts them into practice, he says it's like a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And when the storms of life come, his house will remain. So what's it gonna be for you? What's the foundation that you're building your life upon? I hope it's the wisdom of God as revealed in Jesus. It'll help you in your marriages, it'll help you in your friendships, it'll help you in your work. It'll change your life. It'll give you a hope that will never disappoint. So now Paul is in Jerusalem and there's conflict over this. And that conflict, I think, is what is instructive for our understanding of this message that Paul was bringing. And so what I wanna do in the remainder of our time to now is to switch a little gear here. Because now that I told you the story of Acts 21 and 22, where Paul goes to Jerusalem and finds so much opposition, because why? Because people were saying, no, 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 this ought to be about national Israel, and Paul is saying, no, this is a gospel for the entire world. And because of that, they wanna kill him. But because of that, God says, look, I want you to take that story and I want you to bring it to Rome, to the uttermost parts of the world. Now that was a part of Jesus' life 
always. What Paul is doing is just walking in the steps of Jesus. And so in a, in a few minutes here that remain, I wanna just take that, and then I wanna give you another context by which to look at this conflict that Paul is experiencing and recognizing that this is at the heart of what Jesus was all about, loving people. In your text, you'll see that I put um, Luke chapter 15. And the first two verses there give us a setting for Jesus now. It says that the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. See, they didn't appreciate the company that Jesus was keeping any more than those in, in Paul's day appreciated the company that he was keeping. Jesus now wants to address the attitude that's being expressed by these Pharisees and teachers of the law, and what he does is he employs the strategy of a story. And in the, in the context of these stories, he wants to address this conflict that is within them because Jesus is ministering to these Gentiles. He's also ministering to these sinners, tax collectors, people who are outcasts. And this religious leadership over here is saying, no, 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 you gotta stay away from them. And God's saying, no, these are the people that I came for. And so there was this hostility now, in the same way Paul is feeling the hostility of those in Jerusalem who didn't get an understanding of what this gospel was really about. It was supposed to be offered freely to whosoever. Are we on the same page? Okay. So let me read you the first story, because there's three. And it should strike you odd that Jesus would use three stories to convey one truth. But as we go through this, I hope it gives you some insight into these, into these passages. I've done this once before, and um, I just, it just came to my mind again as I was looking through this uh, passage in Acts. So the first story is about a lost sheep, second story about a lost coin, third story is about a lost son. In, in Luke 15, we're told, of this, Jesus tells them this parable. And remember, this is all about this conflict with people who don't want Jesus, you know, uh, really um, socializing or in any way trying to uh, come alongside these tax collectors and sinners. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. He has his 99 sheep. Just write off that lost sheep. Come on, you got 99, you lose one, that, things happen. But not for this shepherd. The, sh the sheep is lost in the open country, and what does he do? He goes out and he seeks it out and he brings it home. And it's such a delight to him that he tells his friends about it. You ever lose something of value? It's on your mind 24 seven, isn't it? You turn everything upside down trying to find it. And when you find it, it's like this, you wanna throw a party. But notice in the text here, it says, I tell you the same way there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than the 99 persons who do not need to repent. That's a statement for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who have lost sight of the fact that people are lost and God sent his son Jesus to redeem them. Then there's this other story in verse eight. It says, or, a little conjunction that joins these stories together. He says, or suppose a man has 10 silver coins and a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now you get that again, you're hearing this expression 
That's why I'm saying here are two stories. One is uh, this sheep is lost in this open country. The other one, this woman turns her house upside down trying to find what's lost. And in both cases, when they find what's lost, it's such a sense of relief and joy that everybody has to share the excitement. And Jesus is drawing the parallel and saying, that's the way it is in heaven. When sinners come to know me, he says, it's like a party. But what happens with these religious people who are just sitting there thinking, yeah, yeah, they're not like us. Of course they're not like you. They got joy. <laughs> but you notice these two stories, they set up a third story. And the third story is a parable of the lost son. For those of you who have not heard this story, I'm going to have Rowan Davis, soon to be Rowan Boria. And um, so my son Jared is getting married to Rowan uh, on this coming Saturday. And so I put her on the spot and I said, I want you to read the story for the people in church so they can see how pretty you are. Awesome. Go ahead. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me a share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his, wel his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to feed it to, the, to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him any, anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he, is, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Awesome. Rowan's mom, Mrs. Davies, is listening in from Wales, and we just want to say, we love your daughter. <laughs> Cute accent too, right? <laughs> now, it seems, let's go through this real quick now, right? It seems that the sons in our story made a very serious miscalculation. These brothers made an error in judgment that cost them needless pain. They grossly misjudged their father. That's the first point I want to make for you. They grossly misjudged their father. They misjudged the father's love for both of them. They, um, the, the young boy, when he was starving to death in that 
distant country serving pigs, which is not a nice place for a young Jewish boy to be, right? When he comes to, his, to, to the end here, he says, you know, even the hired hands have better help. And then if you notice, he starts like practicing a speech as if he has to get in on his father's good side. But when his father sees him, he doesn't even let him finish the speech. Before you know it, man, he's got his arms around him, he's kissing him, he's putting a robe on him, he's putting a ring on his finger, all of which just shows, man, you are part of my family, man. You were lost and now you're found. The older brother, though, becomes angry, refuses to go in. And what happens? The father goes out to plead with him. Look, a lot of the mothers that are here, right? If you have uh, multiple children and you have this gathering and one of them is missing, is it like you spend a good deal of the day thinking, oh, I really wish that she was here or I really wish that Andrew was here. And because it's not really complete until everybody's there. And so this father is the same way. He's saying, look, your brother was, we thought he was dead, but now he's alive. We thought he was lost, now he's found. But he goes out to find the older brother who refused to come in. They misjudged the father's love. They misjudged the father's compassion for both of them. And not only that, if you look at the text, you'll also realize that they misjudged the father's generosity. I want, this is important. When the younger son comes to the father and says, give me my share of the inheritance. When do you normally get an inheritance? When you're dead, when the, when the person's dead. What he's basically saying to his father is, I wish you were dead. I want my money now. And what does the father do? It says the father divided his inheritance among the two of them. Not just the younger one, but the older one. In a Jewish household, back in this economy, the older son, what did he get? a double portion. So he got two for every one that the younger boy got. So when he says, you never even gave me a young goat, that's a lie because everything now that he is working for belongs to him. What he's really saying is, I don't want you to take my stuff and give it to that profligate son of yours who squandered all your money with prostitutes. That's what he's really saying. He said, I work here. I did everything you asked of me. So how much joy does it seem that older brother has? Very little. See, they misunderstood their father's heart as well. And as a result of that, they couldn't really understand this joy inexpressible that was beginning to surface from their dad. His son, whose last words were harsh and self-centered, his son, who he thought perhaps was slipping away day by day. This son whose lifestyle had robbed him of his life, now he decides, now he, now he, now he becomes to an awareness that his son is alive. And his son was lost, where? Out in the open country. Can I suggest to you that the reason why we started this story with the lost sheep it was a setup for a lost son who got so entrenched in the world that he lost himself to it. But it didn't mean the father wasn't there to welcome him back home. And now, what about grace overflowing? That was another thing that they just didn't realize. They totally misjudged the father. He had this grace that just overflowed. The fatted calf, look. The older boy, his labor was for, forced. He was filled with resentment over the display that was now being showered on his brother. He didn't see the brother with the same eyes. And it's interesting, isn't it, that when you show grace, it seems to have a way of offending our sense of fairness. It's not fair. Does everybody want fair? Is that really what you want? Do you want fair? Because fair means that you get exactly what you deserve. The last time I looked at grace, it was giving you what you don't deserve. And so this older brother had a hard time recognizing a father who would show that level of grace to a son who had lived life so recklessly. And the truth of the matter is sometimes grace seems to condone sin. 
I like the way one writer put it. He says, yes, let the prodigal return, but to bread and water, not a fatted calf. In sackcloth, not a new robe. In wearing ashes, not a new ring. In tears, not in merriment. Kneeling, not dancing. Has the party canceled the seriousness of sin and repentance? See, that's how some people think. But the father, filled with the joy inexpressible and a grace that just overflowed, couldn't do enough for the fact that his son, who he thought was dead, has now been found and is alive. Can I bring you back now to, the, to that story of the lost coin? Because where was the lost coin discovered? In the house. So that older brother is lost in the house. The younger boy, he's lost in the world. The older brother is lost in the house. Either way, you're lost. And all the while, the father is there wanting to show them love and generosity and compassion, wants them to share in his joy and in this grace. Can you understand now why when Jesus is standing there with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who are having an issue with him dealing with sinners and tax collectors? They just don't get it. They really don't get what Jesus is all about. And it doesn't get improved upon when you see Paul in Jerusalem and they want to kill him for the same reason. You know, I think when push comes to shove, the only thing that's gonna change for people is when they have a big picture of Jesus. It has a way of mellowing out the heart. It has a way of not expecting to, you know, tit for tat. You're gonna, you're gonna give freely. You're gonna forgive 70 times seven. You're gonna go that extra mile, all because now you have a big picture of Jesus who's done that for the world at large. A week ago, I, was, I had an opportunity to open up a conference on evangelism in Hartford, Connecticut. And I was reminded of a passage that I had read one time in, um, in Ruth Graham Lott's book, Just Give Me Jesus, where she gave this description of who Jesus is. And I wanna close that with you this morning. Because Jesus is enduringly strong, entirely sincere, and eternally steadfast. He is immortally gracious, imperially powerful, and impartially merciful. He is the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizons of the globe. He is God's son. He's the sinner's savior, the captive's ransom, the breath of life. He is the centerpiece of civilization. And he stands in the solitude of himself. He is august and he is unique. He is unparalleled and he is unprecedented. He is undefiled and undisputed. He is unshakable and he is unsurpassed. He is the lofty idea in philosophy. He's the highest personality in psychology. He is the supreme subject in literature. He's the unavoidable problem in higher criticism. He is the fundamental doctrine in theology. He is the capstone, the cornerstone, and the stumbling stone of all religion. This Jesus, no means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-reaching telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He forgives and he forgets. He creates and he cleanses. He restores and he rebuilds. He heals and he helps. He comforts and he carries. He reconciles and he redeems. He loves and he lifts. He is the God of the second chance, the fat chance, the slim chance, the no chance.
His office is manifold and his promise is sure. His life is matchless and his goodness is limitless. His mercy is sufficient and his grace is enough. His, his reign is righteous and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He is indescribable. He is indestructible. He's inescapable, incomprehensible. He is irrefutable and irresistible. I cannot get him out of my head and I cannot get him out of my heart. I can't outlive him and I can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found they couldn't stop him. Satan tried to tempt him, but found he couldn't trip him. Pilate examined him on trial, but could find no fault. The Romans crucified him, but they couldn't take his life because death couldn't handle him and the grave couldn't hold him. He had no predecessor and he will have no successor. He is God and he is man. He is the lion and he is the lamb. He is the perfect king. He's the king of the Jews, that's a racial king. He's the king of Israel. That's a national king. He's a king of righteousness, a moral king. He's a king of the ages, an eternal king. He's a king of heaven, a celestial king. This Jesus, he is king of kings and Lord of lords. Let's pray. Father, I wanna thank you so much to remind us again, Lord, of the caliber of life we ought to be leaving, leading that you call us, Lord, to embrace this gospel that takes a sober look at ourselves, to examine the fruit of our life so that we don't walk away and forget what it is that we look like, so that we engage the world, Lord, with passion. We engage the world with mercy and love and all the other fruits of that spirit that now you have placed in us. We ought to be a people marked out by love and joy and peace and patience. They ought to see a gentleness and a goodness about us, a faithfulness and a kindness and a self-control that can only be accounted for because the spirit of God lives in us. I wanna thank you for Jesus. As we lift him up, Lord, I pray that you would draw all men and women to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen.